Hello, everyone, and welcome to CBA's At The Bar, a podcast where we have unscripted conversations with our guests about legal news, topics, stories, and whatever else strikes our fancy. I'm your host, John Amarillo of Taft Law, and joining me as co-host today is Trish Rich of Holland and Knight. Hi, Trish. Hey, John. How are you doing? I'm well, and we are back to your favorite genre today, <laughs> true crime, yeah. specifically the Starved Rock murders. Our audience members may already be familiar with the case, either through 60 years of newspaper headlines or HBO's recent documentary on the subject entitled The Murders of Starved Rock. But for those who don't know the basic historical facts and accusations, they go something like this. In March 1960, three women, Frances Murphy, Mildred Lindquist, and Lillian Oding, took a trip together to Starve Rock State Park in LaSalle County, Illinois, a popular tourist and hiking location about 100 miles southwest of the city. After checking into the Starved Rock Lodge, they disappeared for several days after leaving on a hike. Their bodies were found during a subsequent police search inside a small cave in a canyon, one of the most frequented locations in the park. The victims were bound with twine, their legs spread, their undergarments torn away from their bodies. All three women were brutally beaten to death. Chester Weger, a dishwasher at the lodge where the victims were staying, was eventually arrested for their murders. Several employees at the lodge told police that Weger had come to work the day after the women disappeared with numerous scratches on his face. The twine used to bind the victims matched twine used in the lodge's kitchen where Weger worked. Weger's description matched that of an assailant who bound a teenage girl with twine and raped her at another nearby state park months earlier, and he was later identified as the rapist in a police lineup, the validity of which was rather problematic, as I'm sure we'll discuss. In November 1960, after a lengthy interrogation, Weger confessed to the murders and led police and reporters through a detailed reenactment of the killings at the actual crime scene, although he recanted his confession almost immediately thereafter. Other evidence of his guilt included a buckskin jacket that was said to have untested human blood on it, a statement in his confession that he'd hid the bodies in the cave because he saw a red plane flying overhead and didn't want to be seen. Such a plane was later confirmed to be flying over the park on the day of the killings. And an unprosecuted accusation made against Uyghur years earlier that he had raped an eight-year-old girl when he was 12 years old. And yet from the day of his arrest... And over the course of the last 62 years, Uyghur's guilt or innocence has been the topic of sharp and even bitter debate, dividing the community where the murders took place to this day. Uyghur was paroled in 2020, the longest serving prison inmate in Illinois. And since then, there have been new developments in the case, which some believe shed light on whether the right man was convicted of this heinous crime so many years ago. Joining us to discuss the case, those new developments, and more are Chester Weger's defense attorneys, Andy Hale and Celeste Stack of Hale and Monaco here in Chicago. Andy, Celeste, thank you for joining us and welcome to At the Bar. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So before we get to the new developments in the case that I teased uh, in the intro there, I, I want our audience to have an understanding of the case against Chester through your eyes. I laid out the basic facts of the case against him in the intro there, and I'd like to discuss at least some of those elements with you because I know that most, if not all of them, are uh, contested to this day. But let's start with the big one, the one that the jurors in the 1961 trial ultimately found was dispositive for their guilty conviction. That's Chester's confession. You believe that was a false, a coerced confession, right? Yes, it was. It was a false exactly. it was a false confession. <laughs> yes. What makes you say that? Uh well, how much time do you have? Do we have we have an hour? <laughs> we have an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> let me let me break it down in a couple points. First of all, it's a confession only case for one. So there's no physical evidence corroborating his guilt. So that's the first red flag. Second red flag is if you look at the factors, you know, from the Innocence Project and others that lead to false confessions, they're all present here. I think the biggest one typically is threats of death or serious bodily harm. You see that a lot in false confession cases. Here, Chester Weger was threatened repeatedly with the electric chair if he didn't confess. They surveilled him 24 seven for a whole month before he confessed. I mean, I've never heard anything like it. It's outrageous. Uh, and third, if you look at the confession, and I'm giving you a very, very short summary, yeah. if you look at the confession, it's absolutely ridiculous what he says. 
you know, he's on his break at work. He's going to rob these three ladies that are staying at the lodge. And then there is a the little altercation. The ladies attack him and then he kills one and then he's got to kill all three. And then he's got to, for some reason, drag him into a cave. I mean, I could go on and on. The confession itself is absolutely ridiculous. It makes no sense. So there's nothing about the confession that's legit. And Celeste, you can add to that whatever I left out. Yes, Andy's right. But what I want to say briefly about the confessions is around 1991, as a prosecutor, I was interested in DNA, and that led quickly to me investigating for the next 20 some years as a prosecutor claims of wrongful conviction. I fought a lot of them, and there were definitely legitimate cases in there. And I looked at a lot of confessions. These confessions are outrageous. If you look at them, you will see so many I don't knows, so many leading. And as Andy pointed out, it doesn't make sense. Chester's uh, just turned 21. He's a country boy, 5'8", 130 pounds, been working there for years, no problems. The crimes you mentioned in the introduction were thrown together. They'd been dismissed, discarded, and they brought him in and violated every constitutional right. But the confessions were ridiculous. And Chester, obviously not knowing what he was talking about, and there's much more that ties in with the other quote-unquote state evidence. So I, I wanted to get to some of the other physical evidence that I mentioned in my intro, but let's stay with the confession for just one moment. It's my understanding that it was obtained from a police officer. Is it Bill Drummond? I think that's how you pronounce his name. Dummit. Dummit, who had known credibility problems, right? Even the prosecution admitted that this guy had a questionable reputation. Is that right? Yes, correct. And he gets impeached at trial. You know, Chester testifies that driving back from Chicago after the polygraph that he allegedly failed, that Bill Dummett threatened him with riding the thunderbolt. You're going to get the electric chair. Dummett then is called to the stand and Dummett denies that. Okay. But then what's stunning is another guy in the car, assistant state's attorney, Craig Armstrong says, yeah, Dummett threatened him, Chester Weger several times. I mean, I was astonished at that. I mean, that just tells you everything right there. And let me just go back because I think what gets lost in the shuffle is, and when I reread the trial transcript recently, like this is in the record, clear as day. They literally surveilled Chester Weger 24-7 for a month. Think of the duress and stress. This is after the threats of death. A team of eight officers surveilling him, following him everywhere for a month. I mean, you, you, the stuff they did back then, I mean, it's just, you could, if it happened today, it, it's so outlandish, but the threats of death, Dummett had a bad reputation. And in fact, if you look at Donna Kelly, Chester's prior assistant public defender, she filed a petition for clemency back in 2004. She got affidavits from a couple other LaSalle County lawyers who right. gave examples of misconduct by Dummett in other cases were like, I'll give you one. A guy was arrested and he claimed that Dummett showed him autopsy, like, like graphic photos, crime scene photos to get him to confess. Dummett denied it. They got a search warrant of Dummett's desk. They pry it open. And what's in there? All the photos that Dummett denied existed. I mean, it's just shocking. I think the best indicator of Dummett's character is that after the conviction, the murder weapons, which has disappeared from evidence, were taken as souvenirs. Dummett had the branch that was allegedly used to beat the women and had it shellacked and displayed it on his fireplace mantle for 30 years in his home. I mean, talk about disrespectful and shocking. I mean, that was Dummett. Yeah, yeah. that's a creepy, weirdo thing to do. Um what is the distance between the lodge where Chester worked in the kitchen and the cave where the women were found? That's a good question. I want to say, and Celeste, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say it's between one and two miles. Okay. And our window of time is two hours? Basically, yes. So the confession would require 
that Chester left work on his lunch break, traveled one to two miles, tried to rob this woman. That did not work. The group decided to go their separate ways. Chester, who's, who you mentioned is 130 pounds and who I understand all of the women exceeded that, where there were three of them and one of him. He then found a branch and then beat them to death one by one while the apparently the other ones stood there, dragged them into a cave, cut off somebody's finger with a <laughs> knife that... He did not use for the murder, which is really a perplexing fact to me. Traveled back another mile or two, cleaned up, right? Because he would have had to, he he showed back up to work with no blood. Went back another mile or two and went back to work. Is that generally? Yeah, that's a pretty good summary of it, you know? And there's so many things in that. But first of all, you know, the whole concept of robbing people on your break that you know are staying at the lodge probably, right? (laughs) that you're going to maybe run into again when you're working in the kitchen. That, that so just ridiculous. makes no sense. And then secondly, you know, you've got to then kill them, okay, which is just doesn't make any sense. And then here's, here's the part that I always felt. I never believed it was a random act, like Chester Weger or anybody else, like a, a random person in the woods stumbles upon these women. That never made any sense to me. I always felt it reeked more of premeditation Chester Weger then, I mean, St. Louis Canyon is the most popular part in the park. It's so beautiful. The waterfall. You're going to, why do you have to drag the ladies up into that cave? It doesn't help him at all. That doesn't do anything for Chester Weger. Why does he have to stage the bodies, pull their pants down, pull their clothes up? That doesn't help Chester Weger at all. It's a staged crime scene. That doesn't do anything for him. All that's going to take an enormous amount of time where he could get caught. Somebody could see him. And then tell me another case where somebody slaughtered three people in a gruesome, bloody crime scene and then goes back to their job? Really? So, you know, I mean, even Tony Reculli, if you watch the 2010 Illinois Continuing Legal Education DVD about the Star of Rock case, go back and if you can find a copy, I've got one. Tony Reculli, the former prosecutor himself, said the confession was ridiculous. I mean, there's a stunning point where he says, at this Ickle presentation, he, he says to his partner, Bill Richardson, he's like, Bill, this makes no sense. It couldn't happen this way. And Richardson says to him, what are you going to do about it? And he says, nothing. I'm just going to, that's, that's the story. I mean, no, that's not the story. A state's attorney's job is to seek justice. If you don't think it makes any sense, investigate, investigate. He's like, these are the cards I was dealt. No. You know, you're not dealt cards that you have to play. Maybe the police want you to prosecute, but you don't have to. Right. State's attorney's job is to seek justice. So, uh, you know, I mean, my gosh. Yeah. Well, I have to plug one thing here, and that's the, the rules of professional conduct. I mean, for the rest of us lawyers who aren't prosecutors, we have obligations to our clients. But you're absolutely right that under the rules, the prosecutor's obligations are only to seek justice and not to chase convictions. Correct. And I looked a lot at that, like what actually was in force in 1960, 1961. We still had the Constitution, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. That's why Miranda and Brady happened, because they weren't being honored. And those decisions enforce it because it wasn't being enforced or honored. But the other thing is you're absolutely right. It's a good point. There were always rules of professional conduct, and it was always proper, to say the least, not unconstitutional, unethical, et cetera, to put in false evidence. But I will say this, those poor women, they were beaten so severely, one of them was almost decapitated with the old branch that was lying on the ground. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. Let's talk a little bit more about that evidence. There are some things that do stand out. What do you guys make of the cuts on Chester's face? I don't buy the cuts on the face. Oh. So that's 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 another fallacy in my mind, because, yes, they brought in several people at trial to say they saw cuts on his face. They brought in those witnesses. All those people got interviewed. OK, so just to put this in context, the women are murdered in mid-March. 
Okay, Chester Weger passes six polygraphs in the first couple of months, all administered by the Illinois State Police. Then later in the fall, Harlan Warren decides to take over the investigation from the Illinois State Police. And he brings Chester to a polygraph. For, you know, he does his own secret polygraph in Chicago, which Chester allegedly fails. And then they interview people in September and October trying to get dirt on Chester Weger. And they're interviewing people. So they're asking people about scratches. Here's my main, my main point on that. Chester is interviewed three times in the first several weeks after the murders by the Illinois State Police, three separate times. There's a report about this. They talk to him, they get his jacket, they ask him his whereabouts, just like they're interviewing everybody else. There is nothing in this two page document about Chester having scratches, his appearance looking suspicious or unusual, nothing about it at all. And in fact, there's a lot of reports that were, uh, you know, it was pre Brady, but I've seen lots of reports of interviews of lodge employees who said, no, I didn't see any scratches. I never heard anything about scratches. The scratches was a fiction. What about the blood on the jacket? The blood on the jacket actually is in my column because these three women got beaten to death with a blunt object. Blood would be everywhere. What the FBI witness said at trial was that, and I'm using the word minute, that's right out of the transcripts, minute spots of blood, the size of a wow. pinpoint. Okay, are you kidding me? You're going to use that jacket. And you're going to beat these three women with a blunt object. It wasn't a tree branch. My forensic pathologist said it's likely a tire iron, a steel pipe, a baseball bat. There'd be blood everywhere. So the jacket just proves that he could have been wearing that jacket when he committed the crime. Celeste, you want to add anything to that? Yeah. He supposedly carried these three women using a fireman's carry while wearing right. the jacket into the cave. And... You know, I've seen those kind of crime scenes in the photos. His jacket, you know, pictured the body, their poor broken skulls hanging over his back. It would have been drenched in blood. Mm. When we look physically, when Andy and I with Microtrace finally got to see the evidence, those were pinpoints. So I, honestly, I, I could barely see them. And they're just in one section on the arm of, is it the right sleeve? But in any event, you would expect the back of his jacket, he would have been, his coat would have been drenched in blood. His clothing would have been drenched in blood. We've seen the jeans, you know, and there's nothing there. And Andy, what do you think about the point that the Illinois State Police already looked at the jacket and had returned it by the time that the FBI got it and found tiny, tiny specks on the sleeve. Have right. we confirmed that? Well, yeah, that interview report I, I mentioned a minute ago where the Illinois State Police interviewed Chester Weger in March and April several times. They take his jacket and they said they're going to submit it to the lab. I've never seen any lab reports about what happened. Hmm. Obviously, nothing incriminating because nothing was used at trial regarding it. So it's not like the jacket only came up in October or November. The, yeah, the jacket... They had the jacket back in, in March and April and, and nothing. Came and they of it. gave so, it back. And they gave it back. And then I can't stress this enough. And I mean, we probably don't have enough time to get into this on this podcast here. But there's this issue, and maybe we can't talk about it, about these two brothers that are overheard by a telephone operator. OK, talking about bloody overalls. The kids got to get rid of the bloody overalls. There are these two brothers who are linked to this crime for sure. And somehow they fall by the wayside in late August, early September. And now Harlan Warren takes over the investigation from the Illinois State Police in a secret way. And he gets Dubman and Hess as his right hand men. And they now embark on this case to solve the case. And now Chester is brought for another polygraph. They're talking to people about scratches. They're trying to uh, make a case against him. I mean, there's so much. And even the twine, you talked about the twine at the outset. This is one that makes me want to scream. It has been a lie told over the years that the twine matched the lodge. It did not. It did not. At the crime scene, there were two types of twine. 
20 strand and 10 strand. 20 strand was absolute common twine you could get anywhere. They could never, even at trial, they couldn't say that twine from the crime scene came from the lodge. And more importantly, the lodge did not have any 10 ply twine, mm. none. They went to Chester's house. What did they find? 12 ply twine. There mm. was no 12 ply twine at the crime scene. Harlan Warren lied when he said there was this twine strung together 20 and 12 for 32 total strands. That is a lie. It was 20 and 10. I mean, it is simply false. And I talk about this case in front of the, I was at the LaSalle Rotary Club, the Peru Rotary Club. I always get this question, oh, the twine matched. No, the twine did not match. It was not, the twine was so exculpatory, but this tale has been told over the years. And I've got a document. Go to my podcast website, andyhalepodcast.com. I wrote like a six page article called The Tale of the Twine. You can read about all the twine evidence in detail and I attach all the exhibits. I urge you to go read A Tale of the Twine. So we have to take a quick break, but before we do that, I just wanna ask about one more piece of evidence. What about the rape in the nearby state park of the teenage girl a few months before the killings? So uh, a couple things on that. Chester denies that. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. Let's say for sake of argument, it is true, okay? It is not factually relevant to this case because these women were not raped. There was no evidence of a sexual assault or rape. No semen, no injuries to their vaginas. Well, their underwear was me, torn away and their legs were spread, right? Yeah, because it's a staged crime scene. If you'd have told me that Chester Weger, when he was 12 years old, 15 years old, bashed a girl's head in with a brick, beat her with a baseball bat, something like that, I think you know you may have some relevance. The fact that there may or may not have been a rape is not relevant to this crime scene. It's not what happened to these ladies. And it's just been used over the years to say, hey, Chester's a bad guy. He's got this prior past, blah, blah, blah. Dirty him up. Don't feel sorry He's for him. He's the boogeyman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so that's all. That's that's another, you know, just dirty tail attempt to make him look like a bad guy. That's probably a good place for us to take a break. We'll be right back. And we're back. Andy, Celeste, there have been some very interesting developments over the last few years in this case surrounding DNA testing. Can you tell us about those? Yeah. So I always view this case, any case that I work on in a post-conviction setting, or I've defended, I've defended numerous alleged wrongful convictions for the city of Chicago. I always start with the forensics, right? You're never going to prove your case with a he said, she said. I mean, I'm never going to prove this case. Oh, Chester denies it. Of course he denies it. I always wanted to look at the forensics. So one of the things Celeste and I did, we asked to see the physical evidence. I will point out that the Will County State's Attorney's Office, who'd been appointed as a special prosecutor, opposed that, okay? They did not want me to look at the evidence, which I thought was pretty interesting. We had to go to court. The judge said, no, they can look at it. It was represented to me that the evidence was all garbage, a mess. You couldn't make heads or tails of it. No, it was absolutely amazing glass slides, organized envelopes, everything labeled. So we found things that we thought could be tested. Hairs found on the victims, twine found on the victims, cigarette butts that were found at the scene. We took all those things and we submitted those for nuclear DNA testing. Unfortunately, due to the age of the evidence uh, and the condition of the evidence, there was only one piece of all that evidence that we could get a nuclear DNA profile for. It was a hair found on the glove of Mrs. Murphy, the finger of which she had her fingertip cut off. That nuclear profile excluded Chester Weger, okay? That's a hair of some other male. We don't know who. We now want to submit that hair into the CODIS database to see if we can get a hit. We haven't done that yet. That's going to happen soon. And that hair was significant because back in the day, there was another hair found on that same finger of Mrs. Murphy that the state 
submitted to the Washington University Medical School. And they found all they could say at the time was it was dissimilar to Chester Uyghur. But my point is, it was a hair that the state thought was so significant, they sent it to be tested, just like the one we sent to be tested. So in my opinion, that hair that's found on Miss Murphy on her finger, it's not Chester Uyghur, exonerates him alone, alone. But combined with everything else we have, there's a clear cut case. This is not Chester Uyghur. I assume the blood that was on the jacket is not testable. The blood on the jacket, unclear. The problem with the jacket was it was commingled with the women's clothing. So there's a chance it could be contaminated. Unlike hairs where if I had a hair right now in my in my finger and I we all we all touched it, we just wash the hair off and test it. There's no contamination mm-hmm. issue. The jacket wasn't that way. The jacket has been contaminated because of the way it was stored. Which is just outrageous. I'm sorry, but I, this is where I get really angry that they commingled that. You know, invest in another plastic bag for crying out loud. <laughs> right. And so, you know, we we tried to test. I mean, it's not like I just took one hair and submitted mm-hmm. it to the lab. We submitted like, you know, eight categories of things. Uh, hoping to get nuclear profiles for everything. And again, only because of the age and the condition, we could only get it for this hair on Mrs. Murphy's glove. But it was a significant result. It was a significant piece of evidence, you know, that we are going to use. And it's the, kind of the, the the cornerstone of our argument of why Chester Uyghur is innocent. By the way, just they never found this finger, right? No, I wonder where that missing fingertip is. Good question. In all these true crime cases I work on, and I do a lot of work, like I said, for the city of Chicago, where it's like a true crime case. There's always something that might look small, but it's actually huge. And what I saw in the autopsy report that Mrs. Murphy's missing the tip of her finger, and I saw handwritten notes from the crime scene people, no explanation for missing fingertip. And it says in the autopsy, apparently, post-mortem. I was like, what the heck is this? That, I mean, that to me, and we're going to talk about this, that to me is more like a mob thing more than anything, cutting off that little fingertip. One other thing on the evidence is um, you must understand that the clothing of Mrs. Murphy, another thing, she had been defecated and urinated on. We were very hopeful that those biological fluids would be filled with DNA after 60 years. Very excited to find Mrs. Murphy's clothing. It's gone. All the major, you know, the the murder weapons, gone, disappeared, no explanation. Case files. You know, Andy's done an amazing job putting together so much from the little we have because The defense immediately filed motions for discovery to produce and impound physical evidence. First day appeared and all denied. One of the reasons they were denied, because they might contain exculpatory evidence. And that was all perfectly legal (laughs) in 1960s to withhold exculpatory evidence from the defense. And the state here admitted in a written pleading that they withheld it. And then what really gets me going is that they destroyed the most important evidence and they commingled his jacket. And today that's a class four felony in Illinois for police prosecutors to do that. You know, it's incredible when you think about it, that it wasn't that long ago. 1960 was not that long ago that it was pre-Brady. I mean, to think that you could have a trial where somebody had evidence, oh, All these witnesses saw somebody else do it. Oh, we've got a hair that doesn't match Chester Uyghur. Oh, we've got something else. Who who knows what else they had? That you wouldn't have to turn it over. Like, you would have thought that would have been something from like 100 years ago. Like, that's so archaic. Like, like how can that be? That was just 1964. This is, yeah. I mean, I got to tell you, when I started researching, I didn't grow up in Illinois. So I don't I didn't know I didn't have like a lot of background on this. And I think if you grew up here, you probably sort of 
knew about this growing up. But Trisha's um, uh, Trisha's from Michigan, as our entire audience knows. <laughs> she oh, really? Yeah, every what, what episode? Part? Yeah, what part? From, no, no, we're uh, not doing that game. I'm we're not doing the, the mitten game. Come on, <laughs> let's keep going. Oh. Oh. But uh, uh, the interesting thing was, so I didn't know. So when I started researching this, and I don't work in criminal law at all, but it was the first time I conceptualized a point in time that was pre Brady when I was reading yeah. this. And I, I think I heard on maybe on your podcast first or in one of the magazines that, well, of course, there wasn't Brady or Miranda. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> they didn't have yeah. to give. I, I mean, that is just right. that's how old this case is. And that's frankly yeah. how long this guy has been sitting in prison for a yeah. crime that it looks like he did not commit. Yeah. That is just a really, really remarkable fact. I know. Stunning. It's it's a horrible case all the way around. I always think about what those poor women suffered. And then Chester, he was young. He was in love. He had two little babies in his entire life. I mean, can you imagine what he went through? He, he, he <laughs> I can't. His whole life has been sitting in prison. His whole life. Can I talk about that, if not Chester Weger, who? Yes. Sure. Yes, of course. Let's go there. So I have developed, you know, Celeste and I, we've developed powerful, powerful evidence that this was a mob hit. Let me start with, I had two different people reach out to me separately. I had a woman reach out to me, Facebook Messenger, and said she had been scrolling through something to watch on TV. She saw like a trailer for the Star Rock murder. She hadn't watched it. And all these memories flooded back to her. And you can actually listen to my my first phone call with this woman on my podcast, The Star Rock Meters with Andy Hale. It's a bonus episode. I, I recorded the call, not knowing what she was going to say to me. I just recorded that call. She said her grandfather was dying of cancer and told her he was in the mafia. She knew that. She worked for him running packages and stuff. That there was one of the husbands wanted his wife killed and... Her grandfather was the guy that picked out the five or six men that went down there and committed the murder. She told me this. Two days later, I hopped on a plane and I flew out of state to go see her face to face. And I met her and I took a court reported statement from her. And I got to tell you, I got goosebumps right now. She cried. Her body was shaking. She told me, you know, she told me her name. She told me her grandfather's name. She told me where they live. She told me all the details. I've got all that. And I'm going to give all that to the Will County State's Attorney. Can we, before you move on to the next person, I want to just pause on this because I did listen to this episode. Oh, I'm not done with her. Yeah, I'm not done okay. with her. Go ahead. Of your Go podcast. Ahead. Yeah. And it's remarkable because she is so emotional. It's like, um, you can tell it's the first time you talk because, you know, you're over and over again, like, I've been looking for you. I just sent 5,000 letters because I knew you'd be out there. And I said it. I said, she, I've, I've, been wait, I've been waiting for you. Yes. I've been waiting for you. And, you know, and, and she is like clearly somebody who is, it's just like this like verbal like admittance where she's just like so glad that she can finally get this off her chest to somebody who's taking her seriously. And you can, she, I think that yeah. really comes through on that episode. Well, there's a lot of corroboration, you know, um, yeah. for that. And when she told me this, I said to her, I said, you know, did you tell anybody else this over the years? And she talks about going to police departments and reporting it. She was, you know, 16 years old. But she said, I worked at a law firm back, you know, 20 years ago. I told those lawyers about it. You know what? I just I just went out about a week ago. I took a court reported statement under oath from a lawyer she used to work with. The guy is a 1973 graduate of Northwestern Law School still practicing law, smart, honest, credible guy. And he said, yeah, yeah, I remember her. She was an amazing legal intern. She told me the story. I absolutely remember it. So my point is she's not making it up today out of any convenience. She is credible and honest, but it doesn't end there. Here's the part that corroborates. I had the other guy reach out to me separately who said he was friends with a guy named Smokey Rona, who was a known kind of hoodlum right. in the Illinois Valley area, Smokey Runner told him one of the husbands wanted his wife killed. The mob was involved. He worked with the mob. He was the local guy, kind of boots on the ground. Mob guys came down and did the murder. It fits consistently. But here's another one that I think is even maybe the most powerful. I found that memo where a telephone operator on March 21st, a week after the murders, overhears 
two people talking on the phone. And one says, hey, you know that kid, they had a big write-up on the murders in tonight's paper. The kid still got the bloody overalls in the trunk of the car. He's getting nervous on what to do with them. The other guy says, tell him to get rid of them. Burn them. Let's pause there. These guys know who that person is. They're in on this in some way. They know about this. Well, what happens is the police trace the call. It's coming from a bar in Aurora owned by a guy named Glenn Palmatier. And it call is traced to his brother, William, in Peru, Illinois. OK, these guys are in on this. This hasn't been made public yet. Andy, real quick. Where's for our audience, Peru, Illinois, the relevance of its location is? Peru, Illinois is uh, right by Starve Rock. LaSalle, Peru right. area is, is right. right by Starve Rock. So it's a local guy. So you got a brother in Aurora calling a brother in Peru near Starve Rock. They're talking about these bloody overalls in the trunk of a car. These guys deny having this conversation. Okay, I'm working on some stuff now. I can't disclose all of it yet because I haven't made it public, but... I've made some significant progress in following up on this lead. These brothers, th this is consistent with what I've said all along. It's a case of premeditation. Several people are involved. It's going to be, when I disclose all this evidence, it's going to be consistent with the mob angle. It's going to be consistent with a husband wanting his wife killed. That evidence from all these different sources. And then you got the missing fingertip. And by the way, if you listen to that phone call with the woman reached out to me, and I don't know if she said this in my call or when I took her statement. She said, my grandfather said the husband was mad. He was so mad at his wife. She says, I don't know what the wife did, but the husband wanted her to pay, and it was vengeance. Well, you know mm -hmm. what? That's what this crime scene was. It was vengeance, and, a, and, and these women were beaten. And Mrs. Murphy has got a missing fingertip, and she's got soiled clothing and Chester Weger is asked in his interrogation, and I'm using the polite words, did you defecate on any of the women? Did you urinate on any of the women? They don't ask him that. I mean, I've seen, I've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of interrogations. I've never seen that asked. And you don't ask that unless there's a basis to ask it. They ask, did you kick any of them in the crotch? Because Mrs. Murphy has a vaginal bruise. So this is kind of a long-winded hmm. way of saying there is very strong, powerful evidence that the mob was involved as a mob hit, and that's what happened. And I'm hoping that forensically, maybe, potentially, I can get a CODIS hit. We'll see. We're going to do more work, more investigating. But to answer the, if not Chester who, that is who. It's a mob hit. On that point, the speculation is either that wife was having an affair, right? Wife was planning on leaving husband or that husband had a girlfriend and was planning on leaving wife. Those seem to be the theories I've heard. Well, yeah, I mean, and those are kind of the prime ones. And I will point out Robert Murphy, two years later, married a woman, Marion Anderson, who we know two months prior to the Star of Rock murders, gave birth to a baby boy. The father's not listed on that birth record. I don't know who that is. That's, I think, a red flag has to be investigated. I, I'm sympathetic to the families. I am. But we all want the truth. We all want the same thing. We want the truth. And that is a relevant topic and area of investigation. But it could have been could have been the other husbands. I don't know. You know, hard to say. Andy, you keep mentioning the fingertip and its relation to the theory that this was a mafia hit. I don't see the immediate relevance to that. What what am I missing? Is that a mob signature? Yeah, I look at it, I always looked at it like it was either delivered as proof of the job was done, mm. like, you know, or sometimes you see it as like delivered as proof of a threat, you know? So here it would really wouldn't be a threat. To me, it's just like, it's like proof of we're cutting this fingertip off and then we're giving it to somebody, okay? Because to me, the only other angle could be some kind of weird sexual predator who wanted to collect a little prize a trophy but i just right yeah but i just don't think with everything else i know knowing about you know the mob and everything and all this evidence mm -hmm. it just strikes me as like and, and you know who would have done that who would have taken the time to done that it just seems like kind of something where it's cut off and then maybe it's delivered to the husband yeah mm. 
here's a little something to show you, you know, what we got. And uh, so that's how I always looked at it when I first saw it. I mean, it's obvious from what Andy just said, but putting it all together, this one poor woman was obviously singled out. She was beaten more. She was beaten in different ways, including kicking her between the legs, you know, and defecating, urinating and cutting off her finger, you know. So there was horrible, furious, brutal attack on all three women. But this poor woman was singled out for special abuse. And and why? You know, I mean, it certainly doesn't fit Chester's ridiculous tale. But, yeah, it's very disturbing. The mob theory does seem to – I'm just thinking about this now for the first time, so forgive me if it's not a, a fully formed thought. But it seems to fit another piece of evidence that Chester disputes is real. So there may be an irony there. It's a letter that Chester supposedly wrote to his father in 1960, which says in a cryptic way that Chester was – accepting blame for the murders to protect his family. I'm paraphrasing. But if I recall correctly, it very strongly insinuates that he knew who killed these three women, and he was withholding that information and essentially taking the fall to protect members of his family. It seems to me, after hearing your description of the possibility of this being a mob hit, that makes a lot of sense. But Chester insists that he never wrote that letter. It is consistent with that theory. And I know Chester did say on the HBO show that he didn't write that letter. So whether he did or didn't, if we say for take of argument, just for sake of argument that he did, it is consistent with not wanting to say anything about that because what people forget, there's a book I read. There's a local author named Dan Cherney. He wrote a book called Capone's Cornfields, the mob in the Illinois Valley in like the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Oh my God. I mean, Illinois Valley was like a mini- Vegas. I mean, gambling everywhere, mob guys everywhere. I mean, it's stunning. A lot of people today, especially younger people, and I don't put myself in the younger people category, didn't realize that the mob was so big back then, had their tentacles everywhere, were involved in things. And, you know, all we know about now is maybe from like watching The Sopranos. My wife are actually, my wife and I are watching that now. We're binging that like it's one of our, we've been binging shows, you know, post COVID. Um, but, the mob was very prevalent in the Illinois Valley area, especially in this time period. Yeah, there's an article. I don't even know how I came across this. I think it's from 2000. And they're kind of looking back on the Starve Rock murders. And Harlan Warren, the state's attorney who was alive at the time, said, oh, you know, the Illinois State Police, I thought they knew where they were doing, but they really didn't. They first thought it was the Chicago Mafia that was involved. Oh, really? And then, you know, it's like, oh, Really? The Illinois State Police thought the Chicago Mafia was involved. Tell me more about that and tell me why, you know? And so I think what happened here is these brothers, this telephone operator is the hero, by the way. She's the hero. She comes forward. The mob, these brothers get linked to the call, and then it all goes away. And then what happens? In the fall, let's have Chester Weger come in for another polygraph. He's already passed six from the Illinois State Police. Let's take them to a different polygraph operator. Oh, by the way, the polygraph operator, this is going to come out too. The polygraph operator was friends with one of the husbands. That's all I'll say for now. So there, there's a lot more I'm going to disclose. I've got a, I've, I got to finish some investigation and have a bonus podcast episode out. I got some new developments that are coming that are going to make it even more astonishing, but there's so much to unpack here. And I appreciate you giving us the time to at least address some of these issues. With that cliffhanger, we'll take a quick break. And we're back with Stranger Than Legal Fiction. Our audience knows the rules. They're pretty simple. Trish and I have done some research. We found one strange but real law that's still on the book somewhere and probably shouldn't be. We've made another one up, and we're going to quiz Andy and Celeste and each other to see who can distinguish strange legal fact from fiction. Everyone ready? Ready. Yes. Trish, why don't you lead us off? Sure thing. Um, okay. 
So I'm going to read two laws and you guys get to decide which one is real and which one is fake. Number one, it is technically illegal to buy meat in grocery stores in the Chicago metropolitan area after 6 p.m. on weekdays and all day on Saturday and Sunday. Number two, it is illegal for pickup trucks to drive on Lakeshore Drive. For pickup trucks? Mm Mm-hmm. I'll go with that one. Me too. I'm going with Lakeshore Drive. You guys, I'm sorry, you think that's the (laughs) fake law or the real law? I think it's real. Real one. I'll go the other way if only to be a contrarian. (laughs) John is always the contrarian. Okay, yes. So it is illegal to drive pickup trucks on Lakeshore Drive, including actually all trucks. It started, I think, I understand as a ban on commercial trucks, but it is all trucks on Lakeshore Drive. I understand from my own experiences on Lakeshore Drive, it is sporadically enforced. Really? (laughs) Yes. It is. uh, The law about it being illegal to buy meat in grocery stores in Chicago was a law until 1977. Um, I knew it sounded familiar. Yeah, so that law was a result of the local meat cutters union who believed that the meat cutters should be at home by 6 o'clock on weekdays and not have to work on the weekend so they could be with their families. Um, (laughs) And so at 6 o'clock every night, they would put these tarps over the meat at the grocery store and the meat cutters would go home. I and, thought you were going to uh, say it was a law until like 1932. Yeah, 1977. What? I was, I was wondering. I thought you guys might remember this. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know how Man. old you were coming into this, so I thought this might be a little easy today. But um, <laughs> yeah, so the, there. <laughs> no. So the uh, so it was you know uh, it, it was really put in place you know by the unions really pushing for it, and so but eventually in 1977 the ban was lifted because the union realized that. Its jobs were in jeopardy if the stores couldn't sell meat. So now you can buy meat whenever you want, but you can't put it in a pickup and drive down LSD on it. Wow. <laughs> Good That's to know. Funny. <laughs> Celeste and I both nailed that. We get some kind of parting gift for that. We get some kind of mug or uh, yeah. podcast mug or something. We, we've, we've had some hoodies made recently. I'll ship them out to you. Hoodies. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Round two. Everyone ready? Yep. All right. In Wisconsin, as a matter of law, cheese must be highly pleasing and free from undesirable flavors or odors. That's option one. Option two, in Virginia, it is illegal to grow bananas or plantains for commercial production, although household domestic cultivation is permissible, provided its fruits are not subsequently sold. So, Wisconsin, cheese has to be nice. Virginia, no bananas. Well, number two sounds a lot more detailed and uh, specific to make me think you didn't make it up, but I'm not going to go that way. I like the Wisconsin cheese one. That makes sense to me. I'm saying Wisconsin is real. Celeste, what do you think? I'm going with Virginia because it rings of another mob slash union enforced rule. Hey, don't compete with us. You know, because somebody, it's got the right climate. I have a daughter named Hannah, and we wanted to get her banana plants, but we couldn't keep them alive. So there's an area where they would grow in the U.S., probably, you know, Virginia. And I think it's a competitive law. So I'm probably dead wrong, but I'm going to go with bananas. And Trish, Trish, what do you think? <laughs> I think the Virginia law is the real law. Also, though, for the same reason that Andy thinks it's Wisconsin, and that is that John is trying to trick us. And he knows that (laughs) we know that Wisconsin has a lot of cheese regulations. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You could could give me any kind of Wisconsin law, and I'll say it's true. (laughs) There's nothing you could say about a Wisconsin law that I would say was not true. Yeah. Um, So I think he made that one up. Limburger, there's a a lot of smelly cheeses. Uh, Exactly. I think he made that one up, and... In an attempt to trick us, made it about Wisconsin cheese and that the Virginia law is real. (laughs) Section 81.601 of the Wisconsin Administrative. Yeah, I can tell by the look on his face, that smug little John look. Yes. (laughs) Says that cheese must be, quote, highly pleasing and free from undesirable flavors of odors. Now, my question is, who decides what's pleasing, undesirable, 
right? Are, are you telling have, me that uh, in all of Wisconsin, yeah. it is illegal for Packers fans to put blue cheese, undeniably a stinky cheese, on the 10 pounds of chicken wings they order every Sunday? That that yeah. one, that blows there's my mind. Gotta be, there's got to be a cheese board of some sort, right? That's yeah. a good one. Somebody's on the cheese board. All right. And that is our show for today. Andy Celeste, this is a truly fascinating case and discussion. I wish we could spend the whole day discussing it, as we've mentioned before. Uh, but we'll th- we're thankful to have both of you come on the podcast and discuss it with us, even if all too briefly. So thank you. Yeah, and I just I just want to just Thank direct you. people if I could, you know, if you want more, go to the Star Rock Murders with Andy Hale, anywhere you get your podcasts. I've got 16 episodes up there, and I've got a website, andyhalepodcast.com, where I post all my source documents. You there could you, you could get lost down there for days, and I urge you to do so. Solid plug. I also want to thank my co-host, Trish Rich, our executive producer, Jen Byrne, Adam Lockwood on sound, and everyone at the Legal Talk Network family. Remember, you can follow us, send us comments, questions, episode ideas, or just troll us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CBA at the bar, all one word. You can also email us at podcast at chicagobar.org. Please also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, Audible, or wherever you download your podcasts. It helps us get the word out. Until next time, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon at the bar. Seeking to expand your legal network, sharpen your skills, and obtain free CLE? Unless you plan on being a professional failure, that's probably a good idea. Join the Chicago Bar Association today and connect with lawyers and judges who lead Chicago's legal community. The CBA will help you expand your personal and professional networks while providing practical programs and resources that meet your specific practice needs. New lawyer membership starts at just $82 a year. Learn more at www.chicagobar.org.